Through Fire and Water, Chapter 8, My Yehoshua. Reb Nussin did not know the way to Medvedevka. He traveled in the direction of Linitz, thinking that he would ask directions from there. As soon as he left Nemerov, Reb Naftali Hertz began to suspect that his son was intending to head east to Medvedevka, and he sent a letter to Reb Gedalia of Linitz asking him to stop Reb Nussin from going to Rabbi Nachman. Reb Nussin got lost on the way to Linitz, and his father's messenger reached there before him. Not knowing of his father's letter, Reb Nussin came to Rabbi Gedalia's house and asked permission to see him. He was told that Reb Gedalia was resting and that a letter had arrived from his father. Reb Nussin decided not to wait. He asked for directions to Medvedevka and left town. From Linitz, Reb Nussin traveled south to Breslov, and from there he started traveling east. The trip was long and arduous. It was not until nearly two weeks later in the late afternoon of Tainus Esther, just before Purim, that Reb Nussin finally arrived in a small village some eight miles from Medvedevka, shortly before the reading of the Megillah. As much as he wanted to see and be with the Rebbe for the Megillah reading, it would now be impossible. The Jews in the village were delighted because there were only nine of them, and Reb Nussin completed the minion. Reb Yudel was also there, and he read the Megillah. After the conclusion of the Megillah reading, Reb Nussin wanted to continue to Medvedevka, but the wagon driver refused. Now that Tainus Esther was over, one should eat, especially since eating on Purim is a mitzvah. Reb Yudel and Reb Nussin spent a good part of Purim evening together. After eating, Reb Nussin asked the villagers to hire a coach to take him to Medvedevka. Even if I arrive after midnight, at least I'll be near the Rebbe. The villagers hired a wagon and Reb Nussin left, arriving in Medvedevka after midnight. Never having been there before in his life, he had no idea where to go. All the inns were locked up for the night and it was freezing outside. Reb Nussin stood for a while, thinking about his predicament, and he decided to look for the shul. But he didn't even know where the shul was, and worst of all, he didn't know where the Rebbe was. It was a clear night with a full moon. Reb Nussin began walking around the village until he came upon what he thought was a shul. He saw that it was locked from the inside, which meant that someone was sleeping inside. He knocked, but whoever was inside was afraid to open the door so late at night. The man asked, Who's there? Reb Nussin answered that he had come a long distance and was searching for the famous descendant of the Baal Shem Tov, who was supposed to be in Medvedevka to marry off his daughter. The man in the shul was the Shamas. He was also a follower of the Rebbe from the time he had lived in Medvedevka. Hearing that the visitor was seeking the Baal Shem Tov's descendant, the Shamas opened the door and asked Reb Nussin where he was from. Nemerov? How did you ever come to know such a holy man? Reb Nussin told him Nemerov was near Breslov. The Shamus suddenly asked Reb Nussin his name. Why do you want to know? asked Reb Nussin. Well, after the Megillah reading, I was with the Rebbe. People were dancing and making merry. I heard the Rebbe say to them, My student, Yehoshua, whose name is Nussin, wants very much to be here with you. But he will complete the Purim holiday on Shushan Purim. Nobody understood what the Rebbe was talking about, and everyone was afraid to ask. Perhaps your name is Yehoshua Nussin? Reb Nussin replied, My name is Nussin. Maybe Rabbi Nachman is praying that I should be saved from my opponents, as Moshe prayed for Yehoshua. The Shamas realized that the Rebbe knew that his follower was coming and gladly invited Reb Nussin to his house, which was next to the shul. The Shamas carried Reb Nussin's bag for him and suggested that he should try to get some sleep, but Reb Nussin did not want to. He asked the way to the mikvah and went to immerse himself. He decided that he would first pray and hear the Megillah, in this shul, they prayed Vasikin, as he himself did. He would take something to eat and then be able to visit the Rebbe with a clear head. When Reb Nussin came to the Rebbe, he was eating the morning meal. His followers from the town were also there. The Rebbe said to Reb Nussin, You were in the village for the Megillah reading last night, but your soul was here with me. The Rebbe gave Reb Nussin some schnapps, saying that although he must be exhausted from traveling, and probably hadn't had any rest that night. Still, on Purim, one must get drunk and thereby fulfill the mitzvah of Mechias Amalek, blotting out Amalek. Reb Nassim stood before Rabbi Nachman with the utmost respect and awe. The Rebbe said to him, You've already fulfilled the Pasuk in Yeshaya, V'hayu e'necha ro'os es morecha, your eyes should see your master. You can be happy both about that and because it's Purim. Reb Nassim wanted to speak with the Rebbe about his difficulties and especially his trip, 
But with all the people present, he realized that the moment was not opportune. Rabbi Nachman knew what he was thinking and said, Maybe you're still tired after your trip. You need some rest. Say, go out. And also, Hilachem Ba'amalek, quoting the Pasuk in Shmos, in Bishalach. Rabbi Nassim understood that the Rebbe was hinting that he should fight his doubts. The Hebrew word for doubt, Safek, has the same gematria as a Malik, 240, and he resolved to do so. He then left and slept for a while. He returned to the Rebbe towards evening. A number of the townspeople were there celebrating Purim with singing and dancing. As soon as Reb Nassim came in, the Rebbe bade him to sit next to him. I have a great deal to talk to you about, but now is not the time. The main thing for now is, do you remember what we discussed in connection with my teaching about Moshe and Yoshua, the master and the disciple? Know now that you are that disciple, even though there are other followers who are older than you and who are also very pious Jews. But because Yoshua was a young man, Yoshua Na'ar, for that reason, lo yamash mitoch ha'ol, he won't leave the tent. Reb Nassim danced with the other Hasidim, but in his heart, he was apprehensive about the implications of the Rebbe's saying, he won't leave the tent, lo yamash mitoch ha'ol. Much as he delighted in the time he was able to spend with the Rebbe, he knew the anguish he had to endure because of it, owing to the opposition of his father, members of the Nemerov community, and worst of all, his father-in-law, Reb David Svi. He knew that he was going to have to pay dearly for his present trip, since his family were sure to find out that he had not gone to Berdichev. The Rebbe knew what he was thinking and called out to him, Don't worry, Simcha! You must try to be happy at all times, even when you return home. Reb Nassim felt embarrassed that the Rebbe knew his thoughts. The Rebbe said, Embarrassment is also part of that lesson, but one must be Bucky Beshoiv. You have to know how to cope with the difficult moments. Bucky Baratzai, you were when you came here. Now you're going to need to be Bucky Bishayev, more so than ever. Reb Nassim was awed at the way the Rebbe related the lesson to his trip. Everyone eventually left the Rebbe and went to where they were staying to lie down. The following morning, after praying, Reb Nassim again went to the Rebbe and said, I'm afraid that after all you taught us in Breslov about the power of dancing to sweeten harsh decrees, I didn't carry out the mitzvah of dancing properly this Purim. The Rebbe replied, well, today's Shushan Purim, and this is also Purim. The Rebbe went on without a pause. Yesterday, we discussed the lesson about Moshe and Yoshua. I now have something new to add, which is part of the lesson. It relates to the three mitzvahs given to the Jews on entering the Holy Land, to appoint a king, to build the base of Migdash, and to wipe out Amalek. But now is not the time to elaborate. In the meantime, a number of people had come, and they danced and sang until late into the afternoon. The Rebbe said to Reb Nassim, Now you see that Shushan Purim is also Purim, and the light of Mordechai and Esther will shine on you. Just as the Jews received the Torah anew on Purim, so you too will be able to, ve- to develop new Torah ideas. Reb Nassim knew that the Rebbe had something in mind for him, but he did not yet understand what it was. As everyone was leaving, the Rebbe said to Reb Nassim, Presumably, you'll be back before you go to sleep. Reb Nassim said, I'll come back in an hour or two. Reb Nassim returned when the Rebbe was already lying down, ready to go to sleep. The Rebbe began to show how the three mitzvahs are connected to the lesson, and he said that they all allude to repentance, to shuva. Reb Nassim asked him how, but the Rebbe answered, This you say. Reb Nassim writes, I immediately started thinking about this, and as I was on my way from his house to where I was staying, God inspired me with some beautiful new ideas. As soon as I reached where I was staying, I found something to write with, thank God, and immediately put down what had come to me. This was the start of my training in developing new ideas based on his lessons. How kindly and with what subtlety he introduced me to this. The following day, I brought him what I had written, and he was pleased with it. He smiled happily and said, you'll be able to learn if you show persistence. Afterwards, however, I was obliged to discontinue the practice until I had covered much ground in halachic literature and made a study of the Kabbalah. He then instructed me to develop new ideas and later on to write them down. After Purim, the Rebbe was busy with preparations for his daughter's wedding, though Reb Nassim always managed to spend time with him each day. The wedding took place on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, Thursday, March 24th, and the following Shabbos at Shal Shedis, the Rebbe gave the lesson in Lakuti Maran, 
Torah Mem Tes, which contains allusions to Nisan, Sara, Yitzchak, which is the name of the Chasan, and the concepts of bride and wedding. Reb Nassan writes, The Rebbe said that he had not given this lesson for our sakes, but because of the decree of forced conscription, which had recently been made against the Jews. The Rebbe discussed the subjugation of the heathen nations. For I will make an end, kala, ki ese kala, of all the nations. That's a pasuk in Yirmiya. This is the concept of a bride, kala. But, you who cleave unto Hashem your God are alive, every one of you, on this day. The Rebbe's words are very profound and exalted. After the Rebbe finished the lesson, he danced a great deal in honor of his daughter. Anyone who never saw him dance never saw good in his life. For although, thank God, we had the privilege of seeing a number of tzaddikim dancing in honor of the bride, there was nothing to compare with the way the Rebbe danced. Anyone present would certainly have been moved to genuine repentance for all his sins. It is absolutely impossible to describe in writing the tremendous atmosphere of fervor and excitement among those who were standing there during the dancing. The Rebbe delivered a number of very elevated lessons on the subject of dancing and hand clapping. The subject of dancing is also discussed in that lesson. Normally, the Rebbe would dance only at very rare intervals, but in the course of this year, 1802-1803, he danced several times on Simchas Torah, Shabbos Chanukah, Purim, and afterwards at the wedding of his daughter. He himself said, This year I have danced a great deal because of the news of the forced conscription. The Rebbe taught that through dancing it is possible to mitigate harsh judgments and annul harsh decrees. When Reb left Nemerov, he expected that he would be home in time for Pesach. However, when he heard that the Rebbe would be remaining in Medvedevka until after Pesach, he decided to stay as well, at least until the Rebbe told him to go home. In the meantime, the Rebbe said nothing. Reb Nassim knew the reception that awaited him in Nemerov, but he decided not to worry about it. He felt that the Rebbe had been preparing him for what he would have to endure through his constant references to the lesson about Moshe and Yehoshua, which speaks about the supreme value of holding one's peace in the face of embarrassment and degradation. This was the only time in his life that Reb Nassim spent Pesach in close proximity to the Rebbe. On the first night of the festival, the minion was held in an inner room, Reb Nassim recited the hollow with tremendous fervor to, to the delight of the Rebbe, who said, Fortunate is the mother of such a child. Reb Nassim was still praying after everyone else had finished. The Rebbe's custom was to celebrate the Seder alone with his family. As Reb Nassim left, he saw the Rebbe sitting at his Seder table. Reb Nassim so much wanted to see the Rebbe at the Seder that he came back after finishing his own Seder. He looked through the window and saw how the Rebbe was standing, holding his cup and reciting Shfeich Chamascha El Agoyim. This was the only time in his life that Reb Nassim had the opportunity to see the Rebbe at the Seder, and he was always grateful for it. After Pesach, Reb Nassim came back from Medvedevka together with the Rebbe, attending to his needs on the way. They again passed through Linitz, where the rest of Reb Hasidim prayed with Reb Gedalia in their customary way, with joyous fervor, shouts, and cries especially Reb Nassim. Reb Gedalia said to Rabbi Nachman, Surely when entering the palace of the king, one does so quietly and reverentially. The Rebbe replied, I agree with the early Hasidim, who used to jump into the king's palace in their sweaty sleeves. Reb Nassim was so inspired by all that he heard from the Rebbe during the return trip that he completely forgot that he would ha- soon have to go home. But the Rebbe said to him, You must go back now. The Rebbe understood Reb Nassim's concern about what he would have to face and said to him, Remember, a person must travel on a very narrow bridge. The main thing is not to be afraid. Reb Nassim badly needed that encouragement. Some of the things his family had given him, thinking he was going to his aunt in Berdichev, were torn and dirty, and his pillow had come apart, forcing him to put all the feathers in a cheap sack. All this caused him great embarrassment when he came home. For his father, it was the last straw, and he finally threw him out of the house for good. For the first time since his marriage, Rav Nassim moved into his own home and began to support himself independently.